We are so glad that everyone is joining us as we hear from our missionary. The Reverend Kristen Engstrom currently serves with the ELCA Global Mission Unit. She is um, assigned to the Lutheran Church in Senegal. And right now she is joining us from um, her US home in Minnesota. And we're so grateful for her presence with us in this virtual space. We are recording today um, the last week of Vicar Beth's internship. So we know that if you are watching this, you're probably watching it post August 2nd, um, but this was recorded in the week just prior to her departure. So we're grateful to have Vicar Beth joining us in this time of conversation as we consider God's work, not just in Phoenix, not just in Arizona, not even just in the US, but throughout the world, and in particular, in the country of Senegal. So, um, Pastor Kristen, good to have you with us. Could you Thank first- you for having me. Yeah. Could you first uh, share with us where you grew up, where you went to undergrad and seminary, um, and any other information you'd like to share that helps us see you as a whole person? Sure. Um, my story is sort of a story of like the threads of your life coming together, at least to the point where I am now. I grew up in the northern Midwest, uh, mostly in Minnesota and Iowa. And then uh, for university, I went east uh, to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I studied comparative literature and international relations with an emphasis in Africa, even though I'd never been there. Um, and then after seminary, I stayed in Madison for a couple of years and worked at the church there. And then I reluctantly, as many pastors do, um, followed God's consistent nudging or uh, hints and all sorts of things uh, to go to seminary and study to be a pastor. Uh, and I studied in Chicago at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago and actually was there for a year, I think, at the same time as Pastor Sarah. Um, and then uh, went to New Jersey uh, for my first call for about six or seven years, I think, six years um, in northern New Jersey. Um, and then some events in my life opened up some doors, um, and I got to take a call in Global Mission for ELCA Global Mission, which is something I'd always felt called to do. Um, and I uh, became the country coordinator for the YAGM program, uh, Young Adults in Global Mission, uh, which is an ELCA program. And they were starting the YAGM program in Senegal, and I uh, responded to that call uh, was asked to accept that call to move to Senegal about four and a half years ago uh, and begin the Yagan program in Senegal. Uh, so that's a little bit about who I am. Thank you. Your ministry with the global mission unit of our church body, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, um, has embraced in the last couple decades, probably three decades, um, a distinctly different model of uh, mission than we had in the past, in at least in terms of our global mission. Could you share what the model is now or what the strategy is now? Um, the umbrella, the strategy we work under now is called accompaniment. Um, and that is, and the hope behind that is what it sounds like, that we accompany one another in mission, or as uh, Reverend Rafael Malpica, the executive director of ELCA Global Mission, talks about it as walking alongside each other. Uh, he uses these two fingers here. Uh, drawn from the story of the two disciples walking to Emmaus uh, after Jesus's crucifixion, and they're walking down the road together, uh, sharing their life together, sharing their laments and their sorrows and listening to each other. And suddenly Jesus appears with them and they don't even know it. Uh, but you can think of that somewhat as within that relationship, there is God is already there in that relationship. And so as people of the ELCA, as a church, we seek to engage with our companions around the world, our fellow Lutheran churches, in partnership, in accompaniment, that we walk together, which means that we are not in charge, the relationship. Uh, we do not get to decide uh, for other churches or even get to decide what the relationship is. Uh, we work our mission together by being in relationship. Um, and so it can be messy uh, because it's relationship-based. It's not hierarchy-based. 
Um, but we figure it out together. And that means also that the basis of it is relationship. Uh, and then everything else comes out of that. So, yeah. You have already mentioned that you are a country coordinator for Young Adults in Global Mission in the, con in the country of Senegal. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted your work as a missionary and the Yegum program overall? Mm -hmm. um, the first impact uh, was that in late March, uh, the ELCA chose to bring all of the young adults, all of the Yegum back to the United States uh, from all of the nine country programs around the world, including Senegal. And then also asked uh, the ELCA missionaries to come back to the United States too. So this past year's Yagam program ended early. Uh, they came back to the US in late March and I also came back to the US in late March. We flew out on the day the airport in Senegal was closing. Uh, so it was a little bit stressful, but we made it back to the United States. Yeah, sure. Uh, yep, it was a very interesting time. Uh, and I have been here in Southern Minnesota living at my parents' house. Uh, since that time, um, and uh, along with that, in order to be respectful of our partners and also respectful of uh, the young adults who had applied to be in the Yagan program next year, so would be starting the Yagan program in this coming August, uh, the ELCA decided to um, not have the Yagan program this next year because we didn't feel like we could promise to the young adults that yes there would be places for you to go and people with whom uh, you could serve uh, because as we know the COVID situation around the world is constantly changing um, and that just didn't feel faithful to the young adults nor to our partners um, so the second the first change was we came back to the US the second um, we will not have the uh, program this coming year but hope to restart it again in a year um, I will still be serving as a missionary and working with our partners uh, and try and also looking at how we strengthen the program and make necessary changes to the program. What is the purpose of the Yegum program? Oh, what kind of the Yegum program. The young adults do mm -hmm. in Senegal. Mm -hmm. uh, the Yegum program, so as I said, it's actually Young Adults in Global Mission. It's where young adults from the ELCA or with a connection to the ELCA serve with one of our nine partners around the world, uh, and they need to be between the ages of 21 and 29. Um, and in Senegal, the young adults serve with one of our two companions there, uh, the Lutheran Church of Senegal and Senegalese Lutheran Development Services. It's a nonprofit Lutheran organization. And they serve in all sorts of ways, uh, depending on their gifts. Um, they may serve at a community center, uh, which includes an information technology component, a library, a microcredit, uh, and microfinance branch, uh, and a sports program. They may serve at a school, uh, serving as a teacher aide or teaching English or some English songs. Uh, they might serve at a dairy farm, uh, or they might uh, serve along with that processing milk that come the dairy farm. Uh, they might serve in a primary health care office and work with uh, women and men and children even living with HIV and AIDS. Um, uh, they also may serve in the Lutheran Church of Senegal's offices or in their development branch. Um, they do all sorts of things uh, depending on the needs, uh, requests of our companions and also the gifts and the skills um, of uh, the Yegum. Hmm. Um, please share a story about how God has transformed you or your perspective by serving in this context in Senegal? Um, I've been there for four years, so there's so many stories. Um, it's hard to tie one down, but I think in terms of myself as a pastor, um, and I think also as um, a white person from the United States, who my tendency is to feel like I, I need to control things and I need to like, it, it's up to me to make sure that things succeed or not. Um, one of the things I've learned is that relationship part of accompaniment um, and how much that changes lives. Um, and so I want to share the story of one of our Yegum Spicers and colleagues, his name is Ibu. Uh, Ibu is in charge of what's called the latery or the creamery. That's uh, where the milk from the comes in and gets pasteurized and processed and turned into sort of a yogurt type of thing. And there's usually a yegum, a young adult, who works with him. 
Uh, Ivo, I should also mention, he is a Muslim man, uh, yet he works for Senegalese Lutheran Development Services, um, which is part of the awesomeness of the work we get to do in that. That is so great. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yes, it's, it's one of my favorite parts because our Yagam arrive and they think, I'm going to have a super Lutheran year. Everything will be Lutheran. And that's not the context that we live in, nor is it the context in the United States. Like, we get to learn how to live and be in a relationship with people from all different backgrounds. Um, but Ibu is one of our best, I shouldn't say best, um, but he is a wonderful supervisor. Um, and what I have learned from is the power of letting go uh, and the power of entrusting this relationship to other people. Um, Ibu, uh, every year when he works with um, the Yagam, he takes them into his life and into his heart and just every day, um, the Yagam who work with them talk about, they get up uh, and whether it's been a good night or whether yesterday was good or not, if they get to go to work with Ibu, uh, it usually, they anticipate that their day will be better uh, because they know that when they arrive at work, he will open the door and say, oh, welcome to work. Um, and then make a joke. Uh, he loves to joke with people and then ask to, to for him, for the Yagam to teach him some English words, or he might poke fun at them for something. That's part of Senegalese culture. Um, but, and even as the Yagam are learning from him, none of our Yagam arrive knowing how to process and pasteurize milk. Um, but he has said, even when the Yagam arrive, they usually can't speak the language he speaks either. But he says, I just, I do what I need to do and I ask them to follow me. And then I ask them to do what they do. And if they don't do it quite right, I help them figure it out. Um, and he is so very gracious and so very loving and even Yegum who arrive feeling very uh, angsty that they won't know what to do, feel relaxed in his presence because he takes them in as they are, uh, no matter what they're struggling with, uh, no matter what's going on, he receives them with grace and humility and humor. Um, and so I just have to step back and let that relationship do its work and not try and control everything. Um, so I'm so thankful for Ibu and for all of our partners who take in these young adults uh, and transform them just by their very presence in their lives. It occurs to me as I listen to you that um, people may not know where Senegal is and yes. that that might help us understand what some of the differences between our two church bodies, where um, why that is, why there's some difference. So could you share a little bit about where Senegal is and then yeah. that'd be great. Do you want me to share a lot more along with that? Or I brought my map, which yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. This is um, a version of the world map. Senegal is on the continent of Africa. Here's the continent and Senegal is the furthest western country. It's actually the closest country on the continent to the United States. So if you go to the east coast, just wave across the ocean. And then here is Senegal. This is a map of West Africa here. Here is Morocco up here, if that gives you um, a point of reference. And then you just follow the coast down and here is Senegal. So it's just south of the Sahara Desert, the furthest Western country. Um, one thing that uh, I love about Senegal and about the Yagam program there is that Senegal is a 90% Muslim country. Uh, and, but, and then there's also many uh, Christians there and traditionalist people, and they uh, pride themselves on being a country of peace and a country of hospitality. Um, they're called, uh, the Senegal is the land of Taranga, which basically means excessive hospitality. Uh, so sort of like I talked about Ibu, just welcoming in the Yagam into their life. That's how life is there. You arrive as a visitor, you arrive as a foreigner, you arrive as someone who knows the people. And, you're taken in and provided for, um, no matter if you're a Muslim or Christian or traditionalist, um, what people talk about is we see one another as human beings. I see you as my brother, as my sister, as a fellow person, before I worry about if you're a man or a woman, if you're white or black, if you are Muslim or Christian, we are all human beings together. Um, and that is an amazing context to live in. And frankly, as the coordinator of young adults who come from the United States, uh, all of the Yagam talk about just being changed by living with Muslim host families, living with Christian host families, working with Muslims, working with Christians, and living that peace and that interfaith relationship, not just talking about it, but that we live it. Um, and that their Christian faith is deepened 
by seeing how other people are faithfully living their lives too. Wow. Yeah. I'm so struck right now listening to you, listening to you and then thinking about what's going on in the US and the division mm -hmm. that there is between people who think differently. Mm -hmm. And we kind of lose what you're talking about, let lose that sense of this is always a person in front of me, regardless of what groups they identify with. Mm -hmm. And we forget to be kind on a basic level. Um, and so I am anticipating, I know the answer to this next question, but if you could share, that'd be wonderful. What gifts do you think the Lutheran Church in Senegal has to give us mm -hmm. as North American Christians, as specifically ELCA Lutherans? What can we learn from our sisters and brothers in Christ in the Lutheran Church in Senegal? Yeah, um, I'm guessing the one that you're anticipating is that living in peace uh, part of it, but that um, would be a huge part of it to me. Um, because the Lutheran Church in Senegal, they're the largest Protestant denomination, the Catholic, the Roman Catholics are the largest and then them, but there are, I think, 16 parishes uh, and about maybe four to 7,000 members. So not huge. I forget how many people live in Senegal, 16 million maybe. Um, but so they're not huge. Um, but the church, people in the church, um, at most are probably second generation Christians. Some of them grew up as Muslim and converted. Some grew up maybe as Roman Catholic and became uh, Lutherans. Uh, but that sense of living in peace and being proud of your faith and living your faith, but also respecting the faith of others. Many people in the church, their father might be Muslim, their brother might be Muslim, like families are mixed also. And so when you're talking about living peacefully, it also applies to your family uh, and you wanna have peace in your family, you want to have peace in your town. Um, at the same time, they're very proud of being Christian. And what we hear in the sermons most often is the importance of living out your faith. Because when you're a minority, yeah. you are constantly being recognized or seen as you are the example for your faith. And so the importance of to the people in the Lutheran Church of Senegal of living your faith faithfully, that it's not something you just can go home and not talk about, or that when you go out in, in the street that uh, it won't matter because for the church there it matters because you're in the minority. Um, and you want to share this faith you have with others. And so you want people to, to know and to see how you live it out. Um, and Christians in Senegal are known uh, for being um, a little bit different, uh, still people, but, but people even regard you if you're a Christian, they have sometimes higher expectations for you. Um, I can't quite explain why that is, uh, but that is, is part of it there. At the same time, there is this piece, but the church also wants to evangelize and wants to share with people this faith in Jesus Christ. So how you balance that being in peace and respecting people's religion and who they are, but yet at the same time wanting to share uh, your faith and wanting to, to share this faith that gives you life and gives you hope and gets you through um, the situations none of us want to get into. Um, I think that uh, is something that they can share with us and how to live your faith in your life uh, and not be afraid of it or ashamed of it. Those are, I think, the biggest things for me. So, yeah. Riker Beth, do you have any questions for Pastor Kristen? I'm wondering, Pastor Kristen, if you would speak a little bit about just the culture and the people of Senegal that would give us a broader picture of what life is like in Senegal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'd answer that. So in Senegal, there are many different uh, ethnic groups within Senegal. I think there's like 30 something. Uh, there are about five main ones. And in our work, I work actually predominantly with three different ethnic groups, which means on a daily basis, I might speak four different, five different languages. I can't speak them all fluently at all. Um, but Senegal was previously a French colony. So Fran French is the uh, language of the schooling and of government, but it's not normally people's first language. Uh, all of the Yagam who come there le learn either Wolof. Wolof is the, uh, were the traders. They're the largest ethnic group in Senegal. 
Um, and then the Lutheran Church is based among the Serer people. Um, and then if, if any of you listening to this are farmers, the Serer people were traditionally the farmers in Senegal. They still are the farmers. Uh, they live in the sort of middle part of Senegal in the breadbasket area. And right now is actually rainy season. Uh, and so everyone is at their farms, uh, even though it's partial desert, uh, amazing things can grow in the desert. Uh, farming peanuts, a lot of okra, uh, a lot of hibiscus, uh, a lot of manioc or cassava, um, but peanuts is one of the main crops there. They also are uh, pig farmers and cow farmers and goat farmers um, and all of those things. And then up north, uh, we also work with the Fulani or the Pular people. Uh, and the Fulani or Pular people stretch all the way across West Africa, the northern part of West Africa. They're the herder people or the nomad people. Um, and they, you heard me talk about the dairy farm. Uh, for them, cows are very, very important. Uh, and so that's partly why we work with cows. Um, and just to give you an example of that sw switch in missionary sort of perspective, uh, there's a story that there previously were some missionaries, I don't think they were Lutheran, they might have been, who it met this uh, Fulani family who was, they, they often live in tents because they're nomadic. And this missionary family said, oh, we need to build these people a house. Oh, they must need a house. They live in a tent. So they built them a house. Uh, they came back in a year after the house was finished and the cows were living in the house and the missionaries were flabbergasted because well, where are the cows living in the house? But for the Fulani people, cows are life. They're not necessarily sacred, but they're life and they're, they're important in life and they're the center of your life and they're how you survive. So they put the cows in the house. We don't build uh, houses for families or for cows, but um, that's the, the Fulani people. So it's, and when I talk about peace, the Senegalese people are also very, very proud of the peace they keep among the ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very much part of our life in Senegal is that you keep the peace by teasing, actually. Um, there are particular jokes, sort of like, I'm from Minnesota, you would make about people from Iowa, uh, sort of that sort of thing, like you tease one another and that keeps the peace. Um, and so it's, like I said, the land of hospitality and teasingness and joking. And like, you can't sit in a meeting if you get too serious, someone will try and figure out a way to make a joke um, because it's just like, you have to sort of like slightly uh, in that way. So it's a very joyous place. It's a difficult place, um, but it's full of joy and peace and relationships. Um, and I can't wait to be able to go back there uh, whenever I get to go back. So yeah, yeah. Well, we're so grateful for your time spent with us today, Pastor Kristen. And um, if you have been part of Grace for a while, perhaps you have met Pastor Kristen because she did come and visit us, I believe, in hmm, two years ago. Yeah, so in 2018. And um, sometime in the future, maybe uh, past this time of pandemic, we will see you in person again. But we're grateful for your time. So your time today. Thank you all for listening and for welcoming me into uh, your space and your homes today. Yes, and uh, let's remember to keep uh, Pastor Kristen and the Young Adults in Global Mission program in our prayers. Indeed. Okay, bye-bye.